So I think what we wanted to start with, because uh, neither, one of us, neither one of us has conducted this session before, and so we only have 30 minutes. And so we wanted to actually kind of go backwards and maybe do questions first. And if nobody has questions, we can launch into our stuff. But if you're already having questions or concerns or problems, we'd love to get those addressed first. So does anybody have any thoughts, questions? Yes, ma'am. So the question was, if you couldn't hear, um, if you're in an area like Chicago and there's not someone specifically that specializes in TM or NMO or MS or whatever that is, um, what do you do <laughs> and what do you tell people? And it's a very common problem for us because we have people from all over the country, all over the world uh, that come to see us because they don't, nobody knows. I mean, a neurologist, uh, there's tons of different areas of neurology, right? So just a neurologist is not going to know very much about this. So what we say is go to the TM website. Um, that's going to help because they have um, a list of uh, people that are specialists at least close to you, maybe not in your area, but close to you. Um, and then second to that, people often have insurance issues with that, right? Because if you don't have somebody in your network. Um, and so we encourage you when you find somebody that is um, out of state or hours away from where you live, immediately start advocating with your insurance and getting out of network approval um, and talking to them about um, why this specialty requires uh, that approval. Um, and even going one step further, or a couple of steps further than that, one is uh, I would always say to people, when you have a rare disease, immediately call your insurance company and ask for a case manager, immediately. Because that person can be your one contact at insurance they can handle so much of what is going on and advocate for you within the insurance system so that you are not calling, getting a new person every time and explaining your story every time. They may also be able to help you with specialists um, in different areas. Um, and on top of that, uh, this is sort of the next level of that, is if your uh, insurance is through your employer, go to your HR person that is your contact with your insurance and have them advocate for you uh, within the insurance company. That can be with finding someone. That could also be with therapies that, you know, insurance quickly starts denying the number of therapies that you can get. And so um, your company that's spending a lot of money with the insurance company can have influence. You just need to make sure you're talking to the right person. So Catherine, I don't know what else. Um, and I would just add, if you can't find a specialist, I mean, look for somebody that's interested in your case and that would appreciate feedback from the specialist. Because most of the specialists here are more than willing to talk to your local physician and give them input about your case. So if you can find someone that's engaged and is going to advocate for you, I mean, that might be the person to go to locally. And then some people just come, I don't know, once a year just to make sure they're kind of on the right track. Is there anything new that they need to know about? So we do that a lot, actually. Yeah. Um, and the way it works, just from a license perspective, your neurologist um, will need to reach out to us or whoever the specialist is um, and request a um, uh, consult. And then usually, I mean, Dr. Greenberg has consulted everywhere. Um, and sometimes that's all that relationship is. You go to your no local neurologist, if a problem comes up, they call us and we can help them with that. Other times, it's like she said, you'll come to us once a year and you'll go to them once a year and you'll go back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, and and have more than willing to work with that other person. Yeah, most of these specialists, Dr. Levy, all of them I think are very good with that consulting relationship because not everybody can make that trip however far it is, um, you know, once or twice a year. Yeah, and there's some great doctors out there that they want to learn about it. And so they, they want to learn, and they'll look it up on their own and, and find out information. And just the fact that all of you are here is a great, great thing because y'all are connected to the TMA or the new, right. not the TMA anymore. But, um, you know, that's just a great step because you can find a lot of providers on that mm -hmm. site and just ask for an in-network consult, you know, from your insurance. Yes, ma'am. Yes.
never really felt like I've been used. Mm-hmm. I feel like I've been tolerated. <coughs> we have a pain level uh, under control. And uh, the first neurologist, I was traveling all this stuff, so I was away from home for two weeks. And so when I got back, the first neurologist I saw said, well, you have cortical flight myelitis, and it's not like a leap of your step. Refer you to a psychologist. He will help you with it. Oh, my God. Well, in retrospect, that wasn't bad advice. <laughs> 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 Probably shouldn't have been the only advice, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, I shouldn't have taken him up on that. But I eventually um, came to the Ohio State uh, Medical Center, and uh, they treat us in the MS clinic. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're glad to see us because we're so much better than their MS patients, that, you know, that they, mm -hmm. they can kind of slip us in. But, um, and, and I have no complaints with that. But when I think of what that first neurologist told me, I kind of just wish he was right. Yeah, I've transferred myelitis, and there's nothing I can do for you. Mm -hmm. And I'm lucky. My damage was between, was my lumbar through the thigh. So, you know, if I would jump when it came, they would have missed me. But, uh, so I could walk. Uh, I had pain and I had fatigue and I had, uh, um, uh, you know, the other symptoms that I'm lucky. But I still have never felt treated. And the doctors I have now, I'm a general practitioner. Let me tell them what I want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The way well, a lot of it happens a lot. Yeah. Patients become their own advocates, and you know, I would say, yes, the one off, the ADEM, the transverse myelitis. The, it's not so much you're going to have treatments forever, right? But Dr. Greenberg mentioned earlier that the doctors that see this all the time, day in and day out, are also very familiar with the symptomatic things that can come up years later. So. You know, you also want to see someone that's aware of what could happen, right, to help I you. Yeah. And I think the big thing of that is, you know, we use that word advocate, but man, it's so true to be your own advocate. And it's hard for patients sometimes to recognize, even in the medical field, I'm going to have to fight what I would hope my doctor would fight for. But if you have a doctor that doesn't understand it and doesn't know it, then you have to be very verbal, right? And you have to go after what's right for your care. And the hardest part of that is when you're trying to work with a neurologist and a urologist and a rheumatologist and all these different doctors, and you want that to be, um, they're all talking to each other, right? And that doesn't always happen. And so it's, it's being very open to saying, this is what I need, and if you can't provide it, I've got to find someone that can. Because there are those people that will work with groups. You just have to find them. They're not necessarily easy to find. And, you know, I have told people that aren't our patients that will call for a consult and they'll say, well, my neurologist won't call. And I say, I suggest you find another neurologist. Because any doctor that won't, it is not open to the idea of learning uh, from somebody else maybe that's not the place that you need to go, especially with a rare um, disease, so. And just to get your point about saying how, what your doctor said, you know, that's how it used to be for MS. They used to say diagnose and adios. I and an MS patient had the same first. Yeah, and it is, could not be further from that now. <laughs> yeah, so it is, yeah, so keep on going, because it's not like that anymore. <laughs> but you remember, you are the CEO of your health, so you decide who's going to be at the table, whether that's a psychologist, a physical therapist, of course, a neurologist, you know, other urologists, all the specialists. Um, you know, you are the one to decide who's going to be at that table. And just like Denise was saying, if they're not meeting your needs, then maybe it's looking for somebody, you know, that does. Somebody else had a question over here, and then we'll come. Mm-hmm. 
You're not always allowed. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's hard. But you talking about that gives me like this really great idea <laughs> um, that maybe some kind of protocol or something could be made by Dr. Levy and Dr. Greenberg that you could bring with you to the ER. Well, actually, to, to be honest with you, last Did you try I that? Have started the mock project to do it. Okay. okay. Okay, because I know they did that for Dravet syndrome. Um, I was in a group of rare seizure disorders, and one of the moms put something together to bring specifically to the hospital because a lot of the doctors wouldn't understand what was going on with the seizures for that particular rare seizure disorder. So just you saying that makes me think, oh, it would be great mm -hmm. to have some kind of protocol and somewhere they could call if they did want to ask questions. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Do you have Did you? Okay. Well, she was just saying how she did tell them what Dr. Levy wanted, but they didn't follow it, so she left. Uh, um, about an hour from Washington. Just saying how the local hospitals may not know what to do with a MOG relapse. Right. Yeah, and I think really you're, you are doing it, right? You you're are, educating yeah. and you continue to talk to your doctor about it. I mean, because a big part of our education is you know, residents and fellows that are coming in. I mean, we t take every opportunity we can to bring them in on the training. We want them to know what to look for. And they've gotten to the point where they immediately call the neuroimmunologist if something comes in looking like, you know, a TM or an NMO. Yeah. Um, but MOG positive, my goodness, we talk about rare. That's the rarest of rare right now, right? So yeah. it's just education, yeah. yeah. So you're... Yeah, yeah, uh, not really. I mean, because there, as they kept mentioning in there, there are so many things that any of those symptoms could be, right? So, you're we're always trying to tell clinicians that um, we're always trying to put TM in their bag, right, of things that you're going to check because there's a lot of things you're checking. So it'd be great if there was one thing we could point to and go. If this is happening, you definitely want to check TM. That would be easy, but it's not usually that easy. So, let's. You had a question. Um, so it would be a lot more convenient um, if if your core set of doctors is local. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um,
Mm-hmm. Um, so I um, am based directly on my department. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know there's a lot of similarity. Is that good enough, or should I really try to make an attempt to find a team? Um, I'm always going to say try to find at least somebody that your MS specialist can, can consult with, a TM specialist. They are very similar. Um, I, mean, I very feel like similar. all our like MS I, s- specialists are experts yeah, in TM. So I, I mean, they've like written the papers. They've done all the work. I mean, Of all the places you could be, that's probably the best mm-hmm. center. But if you feel like they're not talking about TM or they're not addressing those, then I would say find somebody to consult with. But Mm-hmm. Well, that may be Absolutely. something. I know TM has a list of doctors that they recommend, right, on their website, mm-hmm. pediatric and adult. The TMA. What did the I TMA say? TMA does. TMA, yeah. I don't know. What did I say? Oh, yeah, the TMA <laughs> Association, which is SRNA now. Um, they have a list, you know, uh, of peop- specialists from all over the country. Mm-hmm. But yeah. maybe we could start something on their website that is just people sort of writing in saying, even if this is not a specialist, this was a great guy in my area that would coordinate, right, with another specialist. That might be a great idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we have seen tons of TM and NMO in our MS clinic over the years. So, I mean, and definitely for our kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and call the TMA. They'll be happy to tell you what they've heard. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And y'all just talking with each other. I mean, some of the best resources I've ever found out about have been from patients or other parents. You know, they... They know a lot mm-hmm. of good stuff. <laughs> so, you know, talk to people here and you'll get good info. Um, I think somebody before mentioned about the duty to work up to the duty of care. Mm-hmm. Like that's in South Carolina, right? Um, I'm UT Southwestern Medical Center okay. in Dallas. So <laughs> so condescending. <laughs> yeah, I really like that idea. I think it's a great idea. Maybe it's something Denise and I can yeah, work on. But we do it. have a, well, we do this for our schools. We have school guides for TM, AFM, and actually I meant to bring a copy of them for but I'll be happy to give you my email if you want me to send them to you. But our, we have a school um, liaison that works with us. She's a teacher, and she's put together these wonderful guides. And we share them with the schools, and it just really, I think, helps out because it lets them know what accommodations might be helpful. And just like you say, like when they're complaining of something, it's not there is really something going on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that might be a good idea. Yes, Neil.
Um, again, so you don't have that conversation and you can bring in your own meds. This is how you should be treated. So it sounds like you already have a great base to start with. I do. You put your family together to where if you grab this and you have it in the car or make a you know, if you have to do something with your brakes or you have to bring it into the ER to say, here, this is this is for me. So, so glad I'm we're doing this group because this is such a great that's idea. A great idea. So he's telling me we have one minute left. So if anybody wants those, um, they're school forms, but you could use them for anything. Um, we'll just give you our email addresses, and you can just email us and say, this is the form that I want. Uh, and we're happy to email that to you. I mean, it has our logo on it, but that's all right. You can just take it with you. Yeah, just adapt it or so, give it um, to someone in your clinic. So I, mine's a long one, I'm sorry. Mine's Denise, D-E-N-I-S-E, -E, dot Maddox. M-A-D-D-O-X, and here comes the long part, at U-T, and then spell out southwestern.edu. So we're happy to send that. And you can just send it to me, and then. Okay. Um, yeah. Mine's even longer. We're happy to <laughs> send it to you. But it's you the same it. as hers, just yeah. my name. Yeah, it's uh, Denise. U-T Southwestern. D-E-N-I-S-E -E dot Maddox, M A. D D O X at U T Southwestern dot edu. And, and just, just remind me because And one other thing, if you do phone. get a denial from your insurance, you can appeal it. I mean I'm sure y'all have faced that um, before, but there's usually first and second level appeals, then it goes out to external review usually, and sometimes that's when we can get the approval. Um, but you can get involved at, in that appeal, too. And sometimes the insurances really want to hear from the person that is trying to get the medicine. And if it's an employer's going to that HR and talking to them about getting it approved, that and can I work, too. And I will say that, that can be one of the biggest advantages to having um, a specialist um, in the field, in the TM field or the AFM or whatever it is, because we have gotten really good at writing appeal letters because we do them all the time. And so if you're not seeing a provider that does that a lot, um, reach out, find one that does because that can We're make happy a to world share. of difference with yeah. your insurance. We have shared many appeal letters over the years for all kinds of drugs, so. Or even just to try to get more therapy approved and things like that, rehab therapy. So that's just such an important key part of recovery too. Okay, so I guess we have to wrap up. I hope that was helpful. If you have any other questions during this whole event, just, yeah, just come up. see us. Thank you all so much for coming to our. Thank you.